Think Forward. Think Research Channel. So it gives me a great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce a format that we uh, started for the first time last spring, which is a tag team of uh, uh, clinical and basic scientists on a topic of translational uh, importance to the community. And today we have another one of these, I think, innovative programs, translational approaches to uh, drug abuse prevention. And we have three of very uh, well-known uh, nationally and internationally renowned investigators here at UK uh, to present this. And, and um, I will introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Michael Bardo, who is a professor and director of UK's Center for Drug Abuse Research Translation, or CDART. And he's in the, in the Department of Psychology in the College of uh, Arts and Sciences. And his uh, interest is in basic neuropharmacology mechanisms that underlie drug abuse, uh, vulnerability uh, using animal models. And his major focus is the impact of environmental factors during the development of behavioral uh, effects of drugs of abuse. Our second uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Kelly, who's the Robert Strauss Professor of Behavioral Science in the College of Medicine. You also know, know Dr. Kelly is a prominent educator and one of the key function directors for uh, the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kelly's uh, research interests focus on the analysis in the most general terms of human behavior, and more particularly, he's very uh, interested in the ar area of behavioral pharmacology and the effects of drugs and, uh, uh, dr uh, on a variety of the dimensions of human behavior. And last but certainly not least, uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Rick Zimmerman, who is a professor of communications in the College of Communications and Information Studies. And uh, he is a medical sociologist with interests in HIV risk behavior, health and illness behavior, and survey methodology for sensitive behaviors. Uh, his current research interests are examine sexual involvement in drug abuse among adolescents and young adults. So we're going to have uh, these individuals triangulate on an extremely important topic uh, both uh, for the state of Kentucky and nationally, and that's translational approaches to uh, drug abuse prevention. Mike? I hope it's going to be triangulate, not strangulate. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, the invitation for us to present our center, the Center for Drug Abuse Research Translation, and I thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, of course, by definition, you're all aware that translational research must involve, by definition, uh, multiple levels of analysis or interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. We have three separate colleges represented up here, Arts and Sciences, Medicine, Communications and Information Studies, but in, in, in addition to that, we have two other colleges, the College of Pharmacy and the College of Public Health that are involved with faculty and trainees in the center as well. Um, interdisciplinary research, of course, is a necessary but not a absolute um, sufficient condition to perform translational research effectively. We have found that it's really critical to have two, at least two other ingredients, one being a unifying theme or mission to which everybody can rally around, and the second being some overall conceptual framework that allows us to communicate across the disciplines. And our mission in CDART is to translate basic neurobehavioral research findings into small-scale efficacy trials to enhance the impact of anti-drug prevention messages. That's quite a broad spectrum. For those of you who are engaged in translational research, this type of research is typically referred to as type 1 research, 
So we only go up into small efficacy trials and, and not into dissemination, although ultimately that is the long-term goal. In terms of our unifying conceptual framework or overall framework, we have used a construct or an individual difference, a personality trait that's referred to as sensation seeking that allows us to move from the bed to the bench side and back again. Of course, we don't really work with beds, we really work in the community, so we refer to this as field trials in our prevention research. Uh, but we have basic research, formulates its ideas, and it's driven by the problems that are out in the field, and then we take a problem down to the molecular level, analyze it, and hopefully can then retranslate it back to prevention science. What we're going to talk about today, I'll talk a little bit first about some of the work being done in uh, the animal laboratory in basic research on the mesolimbic dopamine reward system. And then Tom's going to talk about translating this in a parallel system at the, in the human behavioral uh, pharmacology laboratory under highly controlled conditions. And then the big bang is going to be with Rick talking about how he does things out in the field, uh, designing public service announcements using sensation seeking as an individual variable to target those kids that are at greatest risk for experimenting with and escalating into drug use. What is sensation seeking? It's been around for quite some time as a construct. It's a paper and pencil test. It's defined by Zuckerman as a personality trait characterized by a need for novel, complex, ambiguous, and emotionally intense stimuli and by a willingness to take a risk to obtain such stimulation. So these people, these individuals have uh, a, not only a need for novelty, but they're willing to take risks in order to achieve it. If you think from a biological perspective, this certainly has a survival advantage for our species. Members of the species who are the high risk takers are the ones that are gonna find new food sources and potential sources of danger to avoid. So these individual differences have been conserved and we can certainly see the expression of them in uh, risky sports activities, et cetera, that are, are pretty pro-social, but the dark side or the downside to this trait is that it has now been widely shown in many in studies across many populations that it is a risk factor for substance use disorders. And that's indicated here on the right photograph. In the Lexington Longitudinal Study that was conducted by our center in the 1990s, we actually went into the Fayette County school system and we tracked kids through the fifth to, through the ninth grades, uh, actually into the twelfth grades, um, looking at junior high and senior high kids, just broke them down into a median split, gave them an abbreviated version of the sensation seeking scale. And what you see here is drug use in the last 30 days by different category groups or pharmacologic, they're really not pharmacologic classes because uh, liquor and beer, of course, could be put together, but different drug groups. And here are the middle school kids. These are public school uh, senior high kids here. And we just did a median split. Those above the median were referred to as the high sensation seekers, those below. And you can see across the board, across all pharmacologic classes or all drug categories, High sensation seekers use drugs more frequently than low sensation seekers, at least reported use. This is not an unusual finding, and I want to point out also, there is some variation across drug classes. If you look at illicit drugs like uppers, um, which would be amphetamine or cocaine, um, you could see a tenfold difference in the rate of use among high sensation seekers relative to lows. Not surprisingly, senior high students take more drugs in the last 30 days, uh, but again, the relationship holds. So, start off simple in science. Our driving hypothesis initially when we looked at these data and others was to say to ourselves, well, maybe it's just that high sensation seekers are biologically predisposed to, in fact, like drugs more than um, low sensation seekers. So our hypothesis that we brought, scaled down to, that we could study in an animal lab was that high sensation seekers are pi biologically predisposed to like drugs, whatever that brain, mechanism and brain mechanisms are that are involved in that, more so than low sensation seekers. And in our laboratory in project uh, one, we've looked at sensation seeking in rats. 
Uh, I use that term loosely because I'm amongst friends. We typically, when we publish, we don't refer to it as sensation seeking, we refer to it as novelty seeking because it is really more descriptive of what a rat is doing. We can measure it various different ways in the upper left here. We can simply place a rat individually into one of these locomotor chambers and determine how much time they spend moving around. And it's, this is a novel compartment, so it's novelty seeking. We can look at uh, a place preference apparatus. We could place an animal and familiarize them with one chamber and not the other. And then we can allow them in the center chamber to choose between the two. And they can tell us which one they like more. Rats like the novel chamber. And you can scale out individual differences among rats here. Or we can give them two different uh, objects to approach. Rats, by their nature, tend to explore, and so they will explore, and they spend more of their time looking at a novel object than interacting with a novel object relative to a familiar. After we scale them out on these individual differences, we can then look at their response to drugs. Uh, the problem with looking at it in kids, you never can really look at effectively the first drug experience. It would have to be done retrospectively. Recall for me what your first drug experience is like. We can't really afford the opportunity, nor can we really expose someone who's never taken drugs to, to a drug that they've never experienced. But in a rat model, we can. We, rats, by their nature, tend to not eat drugs. They, they, they have a neophobia for new tastes. But you can uh, get them to self-administer drugs by the intravenous route. So we do an anesthetic preparation with a small, uh, put a uh, chronic indwelling catheter into the jugular vein, and you can see here every day they can come into this, it's called a Skinner box. Uh, up here you don't see it, but there's a syringe that hooks on to this long tether that hooks on to, the, to a, a head mount, which allows us to hook and unhook the animal to the drug source every day. In the Skinner box you have two levers, a left lever and a right. One of them, pressing it down, leads to an infusion of the drug, the other lever leads to nothing. So not surprisingly, if the animal likes the drug, they're going to spend most or all their time on the uh, reinforcing drug lever. When we do this experiment, we then train our animals up, test them in all these apparatus, and then allow them to self-administer to a stable rate of criteria. That is, uh, when their response rate each day across a one-hour session doesn't vary much. Here's the, the data that we obtain. Here are the data that we obtain. Um, these are males and females. It makes no difference. We have not seen any reliable sex differences in males and females. These two levers here on the, uh, these upper bars represent the drug intake, and this is re reflected by the number of lever press responses on the active lever and on the inactive lever. The active lever is the one that leads to the drug. In this case, it's amphetamine. Um, and you can see that in red, we have what I refer to as the high responder group. These are the high novelty seekers. The blue are the low novelty seekers based on those, uh, that test. We can see the inactive lever presses, essentially, they don't spend any time there, either group. But we do get an inter interaction effect. In both males and females, what happens is that the high responders or the high novelty seekers self-administer significantly more amphetamine than the low novelty seekers. So what we see in a human population across multiple studies, we can model in this animal laboratory. Now, the, of course, the beauty of scaling something down to the level of an animal model is you can then uh, do some things in terms of neuroscience techniques that are not going to be available at the human level. And uh, just to give you an example, and I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk about uh, what he does in his human behavioral pharmacology lab. These are some data that we collected in collaboration with uh, Dr. Linda Dwoskin in pharmacy. And in essence here, we then took those high responder or high novelty seeking animals, and this happens to be on the test, that novelty place preference test, where there was the three compartment chamber, one of them is novel, one of them is familiar, and their duration that they spend in the novel ch compartment each of these dots represents an individual animal screened on novelty place preference, and then we looked at uh, the dopamine transporter function in the prefrontal cortex. The, the dopamine transporter we looked at in, in a synaptosome, synaptosomal preparation in which we incubated it with uh, radio labeled dopamine and looked at the rate at which it was taken up, and we found that the functional uh, efficiency or maximal effect that we obtained in dopamine uptake was related, correlated to the novelty seeking score.
So in other words, there's something different in the prefrontal cortex of a novelty seeking rat relative to a, a high novelty seeking rat relative to a low, which is really quite interesting because there's lots of evidence coming out now that uh, the frontal cortex is involved in inhibitory control, and we know that uh, drug abusers, uh, drug users, and um, initiators also have um, some per perhaps some dysfunction in terms of the frontal cortex or low inhibitory control. So this is just a little bit of a sample of the, the kinds of things we've been doing in the animal lab. And uh, I want now to turn it over to Tom so he can tell you how we look at things in a parallel fashion in his human behavioral pharmacology experimental setting. Thanks, Mike. We, uh, in, our, in our, Mike and his group had been involved in uh, studies looking at novelty-seeking behavior using the animal self-administration model for a number of years and had published very compelling data suggesting that high novelty-seeking animals were uh, in, learned to acqui or acquire drug self-administration much more readily, self-administered higher amounts of drug. We also had lots of in compelling uh, epidemiology data from that Mike sh shared earlier suggesting that adolescent children that were high sensation seekers uh, began using drugs at an earlier age and reported greater amount of drug intake than low novel than their low, low no sensation seeking colleagues so in our human laboratory we decided that it would be important to see if we could replicate the very compelling data that Mike and his group were showing with regards to actual drug taking behavior related to novelty seeking uh, to, at the human level to see whether we got we were able to see comparable effects with sensation seeking status we took advantage of the uh, language skills of our human subjects, asked them to complete a questionnaire, a zuckerman Kuhlman personality questionnaire, which uh, uh, is a me measures a variety of different dimensions of personality. We specifically looked at a subscale called the impulsive sensation-seeking scale. Young, healthy individuals who scored in the top 25% of the population-based distributions on this subscale, we labeled as high sensation seekers. Individuals scoring in the bottom 25% of the population distribution we labeled as low sensation seekers and we invited these two groups to participate in our uh, abuse liability laboratory study procedures. Our typical approach is to study two groups. Uh, we, we generally obtain enough statistical power by getting 10 high sensation seekers and 10 low sensation seekers in an individual study. Uh, we also balance those on a variety of dimensions, including prior drug use uh, as, and, as well as uh, uh, gender distribution. And then we use the gold standard placebo-controlled randomized uh, uh, double-blind procedures to examine the effects of different doses of, of compounds that, that have abuse liability. What I'd like to talk to you today about is, is some data from uh, our D, a study with D-amphetamine or Dexedrin, which is a stimulant medication, uh, FDA approved for the management of attention deficit disorders and some sleeping disorders, uh, has been used in the past for appetite management and for, or for mood control as well, although those, those uses have been discontinued more recently due to the abuse liability of the compound. Uh, in this study, we looked at the effects of 0, 7.5, and 15 milligrams per 70 kilograms of D-amphetamine. That's a dose range that's comparable to what physicians would use uh, if they were prescribing this medication for therapeutic purposes. Each of those doses was tested using a within-subject design, so each participant received each of those doses on two separate occasions, as well as a test day or a training day in which we administered placebo, collected the data, but didn't analyze that in the, in the, sub, in the study itself. That, that training day isn't important to acclimate our, our, our uh, volunteers to the procedures. Um, so each participant completed seven days. Each day we administered sessions prior to drug administration, so a baseline session as well as at hourly intervals following drug administration. During each session, we collected a variety of measures, including uh, their verbal reports or subjective reports of how the drug was making them feel. We looked at a variety of different dimensions of their cognitive and psychomotor performance using computer technologies. We also looked at heart rate and blood pressure. Um, all of our volunteers are compensated for their times, uh, for the time that they spend with us, 
And uh, it's important to point out that these studies are all reviewed and approved by our medical IRB here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, these are data uh, from this study uh, using a visual analog scale rating of how much the subjects liked the drug effect. Uh, reports of drug liking are highly correlated with drug taking behavior in that if an individual reports liking a dose of a drug, that individual is much more likely to self-administer that drug than an individual who doesn't report liking it or reports disliking the drug. So reports of drug liking are an indirect measure of the reinforcing efficacy of a drug. Uh, I'm presenting data from our low sensation seeking group in the left panel, our high sensation seeking group in the right panel. These are ratings on that visual analog scale. The white circles represent data from placebo sessions. Again, this, these ratings occurred under double blind conditions. The yellow triangles are from our 7.5 milligram per 70 kilogram sessions and the blue squares are from our high dose or our 15 milligram per 70 kilogram dose sessions. As you can see, for our low sensation seekers, there's very little reporting of the liking of the effects that these doses are producing. In contrast, amongst our high sensation seekers, prior to drug administration, very little liking, which is good, uh, but we get robust dose and time related increases in their reporting of drug liking. Now, as I mentioned, this is very compelling data consistent with, with what we're seeing at the animal, lab, at the animal uh, labs, uh, but self-report measures are only indirect measures of, of drug-taking behavior. And so we completed a replication study in which we actually allowed our individuals to truly self-administer these drugs. This was a study in which we, again, looked at high and low sensation seekers and gave them an opportunity to work to, a, to, a, to earn different amounts of available drug. On some, subject, on some sessions, there were placebo capsules that were available. On some sessions, there were capsules that each contained one milligram. And on some days, there were capsules that, that for which each contained two milligrams. Subjects were able to work, engage in a work task to earn up to eight capsules, or they could earn a total of eight milligrams or 16 milligrams on days in which drug was available. When the placebo capsules were available, our low and high sensation seekers worked to self-administer a small number of capsules, but there were no difference between those groups. For our low sensation seekers, there was no change, no increase in work when the low dose was available, but they did work a little bit higher and self-administered a little bit higher amount of drug when the two milligram capsules were available. In contrast, our high sensation seekers engaged in substantial work and self-administered high doses of drug regardless of whether the low or the high dose was available. So again, these studies are very comparable to what we're seeing in the preclinical or animal laboratory model showing that our high sensation seekers um, are self-administering drugs at a much higher rate than our low sensation seekers. Across a variety of studies, we've seen that individual differences in the behavioral effects of d as well as a number of other drugs with abuse liability are related to sensation seeking status with abuse liability being increased in our high sensation seekers. We believe that in combination with the data that are coming out of our animal laboratory, uh, that the differences in drug abuse vulnerability may be related to underlying biological differences. Our center is charged with trying to translate our understanding of the, some of these basic processes to enhance prevention, drug abuse prevention. Um, researchers in our center, which Dr. Zimmerman will, will talk more about, had, had discovered that in addition to high sensation seekers being more likely to initiate drug use, to use higher amounts of drug, there were group differences related to sensation seeking status with regards to how they responded to media based information. We wanted to, based upon the underlying biological differences we were seeing in high and low sensation seekers, we wanted to investigate whether the impact of information that, we, that was presented to high and low sensation seekers would differentially alter brain reactivity. We conducted studies in collaboration with Dr. Jane Joseph in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology in our neuroimaging facility here at the university, as well as with Dr. Young Jing, who is a faculty member in the Department of Behavioral Science, 
uh, using her psychophysiology laboratory. Our fMRI technology allows us to look at indirect brain activation using changes in blood oxygen level uh, in response to specific events. Um, this technology provides great spatial resolution but has some limitations in, in terms of being able to identify the, the temporal dimension in which these brain changes are occurring. In contrast, using an ERP technology in our psychophysiology laboratory, we're able to look at changes in electrical fields on the scalp that reflect changes in underlying electrical activity of neurons, in again, in response to specific events. And this technology allows us remarkable precision, uh, millisecond precision with regards to looking at changes in brain activation, uh, but has limited spatial resolution. Well, in our studies, we put together matching experimental protocols in each of those two laboratories to be able to integrate the spatial precision of the fMRI with the temporal precision of the ERP in order to look at dynamic processes of, of responding to stimulus material among high and low sensation seekers. Uh, again, we, we, as in the previous studies, we recruited high and low sensation seekers. Each participant completed a session in our psychophysiology lab as well as a session in our neuroimaging laboratory. Uh, these sessions were counterbalanced and at the same time of the day. Uh, again, we compensated them for their time and the study was approved by our institutional review board. Um, what I'd like to do is just to share a, a subset of the data that we've collected. Um, here we were interested in whether the brain responses to emotional content of stimulus presentation would differ between high and low sensation seekers. Subjects seated either in the psychophysiology lab or in the, neuro, in the uh, neuroimaging lab were shown different pictures varying in emotional content. For example, a snake being ready to, ready to strike would be a, a picture that would have high arousal but negative valence. Um, an individual sitting by themselves in an empty room would be low arousal but negative valence. A cultural icon completing an award-winning routine would be high arousal, positive valence. An animal walking in a field would be low arousal, but positive valence. Each time the subjects saw a picture, they were asked to press a button, and we looked at brain activation patterns in response to the emotional content of these pictures. This is data from the, uh, from the neuroimaging laboratory, uh, Dr. Dr. Joseph's laboratory. Here we're presenting brain activation patterns during high arousal pictures, subtracting out the brain activation patterns during low arousal pictures. So the activation that you see reflects theoretically the emotional arousal content of those pictures. Data from our high sensation seekers is in the left panel, from our low sensation seekers is in the right panel. The crosshairs are located on the left amygdala, and what I'd like to point out is that the magnitude of activation in our high sensation seekers is, is higher in that region than our low sensation seekers. Uh, there's also greater activation in the orbital frontal uh, regions as well. Both of those regions, prior research have shown, are critical regions in managing emotional response. Here's data from our electrophysiology laboratory looking at brain activation patterns as a, a function of time in milliseconds following the presentation of those stimuli. Each line reflects a different emotional category. What I'd like to do is to, is to focus your attention at the brain activation patterns that are occurring 200 milliseconds following that stimulus presentation. There are lots of differences in these data between high and low sensation seekers, but at this 200 millisecond time point, we saw a significant interaction between their status in sensation seeking and their brain responses to these arousing stimuli. We used a statistical package called Loretta to try to identify the brain regions that were contributing to those group differences in electrical activity at that 200 millisecond time point. And that software package showed occipital cortex as well as temporal pole activation. What I'd like to point out is that on our high sensation seekers, we actually get bilateral activation of that temporal pole, whereas in our low sensation seekers, we only get unilateral activation. Uh, the temporal pole is also a re brain region that's uh, actively involved in emotional processing. 
Well, this Loretta software doesn't allow us really strong temporal resolu or spatial resolution, so we went back to our fMRI data and looked at high and low sensation seekers and, in fact, confirmed that we had bilateral temporal pole activation uh, in our high sensation seekers, but only unilateral pole activation in our low sensation seekers. Um, and so uh, we believe that those data indicate that not only is our brain regions different than high low and low sensation seekers, and not only is there a difference in the temporal distribution of those brain activations, but we may be seeing a, f a fundamental difference in the functional manner in which high and low sensation seekers process emotional stimulus material. Um, I haven't shown uh, the, the data, but we also see group differences in response to how novel the stimulus materials are, the level of repetition of materials, and whether those uh, stimulus materials have inhibitory relevance to the subjects. Our future studies will begin to examine whether these factors um, actually impact the, the manner in which the information in those messages is processed, which is really an important dimension for our prevention interventions. Um, and I'd like to pass on to my colleague, Dr. Zimmerman. going to talk now about continuing to translate as we've moved so far from rats to humans um, in basic science primarily and now we're going to continue to move from basic science with humans to field studies uh, and prevention trials. This slide summarizes work that mostly my colleagues over the last 20 years have done. I've contributed a little bit. Lewis Donahue, Phil Pongreen uh, have done much of the early work. Um, first, formative research, trying to understand, once they had come to understand, as, you, as you've already heard, that high sensation seekers uh, are more likely to use illicit substances particularly, to try to understand uh, the extent to which they might have preferences for certain kinds of messages that would then potentially be more effective since they were at higher risk. So formative research. Uh, more or less translates into focus groups and individual interviews with high and low sensation seekers responding over a number of years to a variety of different kinds of public service announcements and other kinds of messages to determine those which high sensation seekers might have a preference for. In addition to uh, a number of human laboratory studies, uh, one called the living room study because uh, it, it was an attempt to try to have people view messages uh, in a way that, um, unlike in a pure laboratory where they had to watch the message, in a, in a living room uh, it would seem to be a bit more like a regular situation where there were other people there uh, and whether they could look away and be distracted. So uh, watching uh, how their eyes were attending to various kinds of messages. Uh, and a recent need for cognition to look at some other individual differences that might interact with sensation seeking. So that was the uh, basic human research that led to an understanding, which I'll summarize in a moment, uh, the kinds of preferences that high sensation seekers have for certain kinds of messages. Uh, and over the last several years, we've uh, uh, implemented a number of field trials based on that information about how to design messages for high sensation seekers. Uh, the first two involving substance use, uh, the first one looking at marijuana uh, use, the second one being part of the national uh, drug prevention campaign, uh, also focusing on marijuana and other drugs, and the third and fourth involving risky sex. So we want to talk briefly here as well about how some of these same principles can be extended to other behavioral risk factors as well. Uh, the two asterisk uh, field studies are the ones that I'm going to focus on in a moment. <clears throat> so what did my colleagues find about the preferences that high sensation seekers had for messages? This slide pretty much summarizes key characteristics of messages that high sensation seekers uh, seem to particularly respond well to. They need to be novel, creative, or unusual, uh, intense, emotionally strong, 
physically arousing, fast-paced, graphic, explicit. Preaching was a negative. Uh, preachy messages were very negatively responded to, especially by high sensation seekers, and unconventional. Typical, uh, not typical, not ordinary. Um, they don't all have to be present in any given message, but typically some combination of them seem to produce the most effective messages for high sensation seekers. Summary of the principles that my colleagues have developed uh, for what seem to be uh, the essential elements of putting together a a uh, campaign, a public health campaign that is likely to be successful, targeted at high sensation seekers. The first one we've talked about. Um, design messages with those characteristics we just looked at uh, that high sensation seekers tend to like. Um, and uh, sensation value is the, uh, is the phrase that my colleagues have coined for messages that have lots of those characteristics. Third employ formative research uh, with the target audience about whatever the topic is to be sure that one is focusing on key and salient beliefs for that population that then can be specifically targeted in the campaign. And finally, place prevention messages in high sensation value context. Uh, in the uh, TV public service announcement campaigns that I'm going to be talking about, that has meant, for example, finding out the TV shows that high sensation seekers like uh, and placing the public service announcements uh, in those shows. First campaign, a two-city anti-marijuana campaign study. The PSA is focused on scientifically documented negative consequences of marijuana use, and I, I must say, uh, when the study started, uh, it was hard to find them. Uh, those, those uh, scientifically documented negative consequences of marijuana use, and my colleagues tried very hard uh, in the literature. Uh, the good news for this research is uh, in the last small number of years, uh, there is an increasing amount of research that uh, indeed uh, has begun to document significant negative consequences of marijuana use. It makes it a little easier to, to design messages uh, when those uh, consequences are known. These are some examples. Uh, and for young people, often the social negative consequences are as significant, if not more so, than physical ones. They, they think their bodies are immune, uh, but they're real worried about what their friends would think. Uh, and so damaged relationships with family and friends, uh, decreased academic sports performance, loss of jobs, impaired memory judgment, reduced motivation, depression. The lung damage, I think, has is, is just been added more recently. Uh, as something that we know. I thought, you know, marijuana was no big deal. I liked how it made me feel like I could do crazy things in front of my friends. Until that time, that thing was a game of Russian roulette. And I lost. I'm alive, but paralyzed on one side. I take medication every day to stop my convulsions. I found out on weed you can't think straight. I only smoked for a few months, but now I'm on drugs for life. was one of five PSAs that uh, we produced as part of this campaign I'll be talking about. Here's another one. Check this out. Those are two of the examples, two examples of the five uh, public service announcements that were created for this campaign, uh, which was tested in Lexington and Knoxville, similar communities. Uh, personal interviews on laptop computers were conducted with uh, independent random samples of 100 public school students every month, every month for 32 months. Uh, this was the same age cohort. So they were all uh, 7th to 10th grade to start with, and then uh, every month uh, 
Folks were sampled again, 100 in each community from the list of students in that grade group. As they got older, uh, we continued with the same group. So over four years, uh, three and a half years, they, they aged up to ninth graders through the equivalent of freshmen in college. So they were, they were followed for 32 months, 100 random, randomly sampled in each community from that list of students every month for almost three years. And let me uh, walk you through what the results look like for Fayette County here in Lexington. Uh, what you see is here when they were 7th to 10th graders, first of all, the uh, diamonds represent high sensation seekers. And each, each one represents uh, a percentage for a month in each community. So here, for example, at the beginning of the study, uh, in, this is all in Lexington, Fayette County, uh, about 23% of high sensation seekers reported using marijuana in the last month. All right, so of the 7th to 10th graders in Fayette County, about 23% of high sensation seekers at the beginning of the study, when they were 7th to 10th graders, reported using marijuana in the last 30 days versus uh, about 7% of the low sensation seekers. As time goes on, the natural progression in, in this country is for marijuana to increase up to about uh, when folks are seniors in high school and freshmen in college being about the highest level of marijuana use. And so you see, over the first year, approximately, uh, an increase among high sensation seekers. Uh, this, this line represents the average uh, regression slope. So from approximately 20% to nearly 40%, about 37% of the high sensation seekers. This is before any campaign happened in the community. Low sensation seekers staying fairly stable across this entire time. The campaign happened, an intensive campaign for four months, and uh, the use report of marijuana use in the last 30 days began to decrease and continued to, to decrease for about an additional six months past the end of the campaign. So in fact, uh, by the end of this point, uh, which is about six or seven months after the four-month campaign was over, their use resembled again what it did uh, approximately two years earlier. Okay, so not only was marijuana use, uh, was the trend and increase in marijuana use stopped, uh, which would have been a flat line, but in fact, marijuana use decreased for this cohort, despite the fact that they were aging and, and otherwise, uh, without the campaign, almost certainly would have increased their use over that time. Okay, after about six, seven months, the campaign seemed to have worn out. The uh, use began to increase again. Another campaign happened in Lexington took a little bit longer for this campaign's effects to, uh, to begin, but then even eight months after the campaign when the study was over, use was still on the decline as a result of that second campaign. And again, low sensation seekers changed very little. And here we see what happened in uh, Knoxville. Um, when this campaign happened in Lexington, there was no campaign in Knoxville. And indeed, their use continued. The high sensation seeker, uh, fairly steep increase in marijuana use continued during the time when there was a campaign in the other city, but not the campaign here. Uh, here, the campaign only run, ran during that second interval. And you see a very similar response here. So essentially, of these four time periods, the three times that the campaign was run in a particular city, there was significant decrease in marijuana use in the last 30 days for high sensation seekers. In the uh, one comparable period when the campaign was not run, there was not a similar change. Um, conclusion is uh, a relatively strong design as, as such things go, suggesting that these campaigns were very effective in dramatically reducing marijuana use for about six to eight months during and after the campaign. I uh, want to say a few words about a very parallel study, but whose focus was uh, condom use and safer sex. Uh, very similar, we, we added the variable of impulsive decision making. So, so the target here were folks who were high sensation seekers and impulsive as well. Uh, a three week campaign, again, televised public service announcements. Uh, based on the literature and what we, we heard in our focus groups, um, in order to increase condom use, uh, 
Uh, we focused on personal threat of HIV and STDs and pregnancy, risk, the risks of not using condoms, and feeling more confident about being able to talk about condoms and bringing up the subject with a partner. The design was, was essentially identical. Indeed, the same two cities. Uh, 100, uh, the difference was these were college students, and there was also some selection of non-college students from the general population using random digit dialing procedures in each community. About 70% college students, about 30% not in each community. They started at age 13, 18 to 23, and we followed them up for about two years. Here is one of the PSAs. I used to party all the time. I hooked up with a few guys along the way, but I always had safe sex, except when I got into a relationship. I never thought I would get an STD from my own boyfriend. I didn't know he had it. When I found out I had herpes, I felt so dirty, and I'll have it for life. He told me he loved me, and he'd give me anything. And he gave me something he can't ever take back. And here's, here's another of the PSAs. I can give you everything you've ever dreamed of. I can give you something you'll never forget. I can put a smile on your face for weeks. And these are, uh, here's one slide showing the results of this campaign. Uh, again, uh, these are the results for Lexington only. What you see here, uh, I'm sorry, the data are actually presented for both cities. The, um, the diamond, uh, we're only representing high sensation seekers in this slide, okay? So those are the only folks represented here. The yellow diamonds, represent Lexington, the yellow line, Lexington trends. The white, uh, whatever that shape is, uh, representing Knoxville, uh, and the white dotted line representing the trend in Knoxville. And this is the time in the study where the campaign ran in Lexington. So what you see, this is uh, how often you use condoms in the last three months. What you see is, uh, before the campaign, uh, in, in Lexington, condom use was decreasing. In Knoxville, it was staying about the same. Uh, indeed, as, as folks move into their young adulthood, as they are more likely to be in relationships, uh, they are less likely to use condoms. So we expected that, indeed, condom use uh, does decrease from 18 to, to 25 or 26. Uh, and then uh, the three and a half month campaign happened in Lexington, and condom use uh, increased back to the point that it was uh, almost a year before the campaign started. And then uh, about three months after the campaign was over, the effect of the campaign began to wear off again. Uh, we've estimated that uh, we, we added about 160,000 protected uh, uh, intercourse events over, over a period of four months. Um, and. Uh, uh, probably, uh, our models suggest we may have uh, averted approximately one case of STD. That's, that, that doesn't sound particularly impressive uh, when you put it that way. Uh, but uh, a, a very cost-efficient uh, way since we're reaching about 40,000 people uh, with this campaign. To summarize uh, our field studies, using the CENTAUR principles of sensation-seeking targeting, we've shown in large field trials that marijuana use can be significantly reduced among adolescents and that condom use can be increased among young adults. Uh, in sum, uh, you've heard about uh, co combining, ways of combining uh, laboratory studies with rats, uh, laboratory basic science uh, with humans, uh, and field trials uh, with communication research that, that we believe uh, is contributing to the field and our understanding of prevention messages and reducing substance use.
Um, and I just want to uh, acknowledge on behalf of my colleagues and myself, many people uh, who've been working hard, uh, some before us, many with us, uh, to make the research possible. Thank you very much.